So any questions so far about anything we've covered? Okay. So let's continue our discussion on reinforcement learning. Just a quick recap of everything we've talked about so far. We still assume uh, the settings of Markov decision processes. That means we are dealing with a problem that is represented with a set of states, a set of actions, permissible actions per state, a transition model or, a di uh, or the dynamics of the environment telling us what is the probability of ending up in a state S prime if we are in a state S and take action A, and a reward function, which tells us uh, how useful or how instantaneously good it was to make this transition from state S to state S prime by applying action A. We are still looking for a policy pi. Remember, a policy is a function that maps states to actions. So we put in a state S into this function and this pi spits out an action to take. The twist in reinforcement learning is we don't know T or R. We don't know the dynamics or the reward function. We don't know the transition model or the reward function. So we must try out actions and uh, learn more, estimate the policy based on trial and error. The, and that's essentially the big idea. One of the big ideas, compute all averages over T using sample outcomes. So here's a quick summary for known MDP, which means we know T and R, we know the dynamics and the reward function. We are looking at a class of techniques called offline solutions. If the goal is to compute the optimal value or Q value or optimal policy, the technique we can use is va value or policy iteration. Let me make sure, yes. If we want to evaluate a fixed policy uh, when, we when we're dealing with a known MDP, we use policy evaluation. Now for unknown MDPs, we mentioned that there are two classes of approaches, model-based and model-free. In model-based approaches, when the goal is to compute V star, Q star, or pi star, we can use value iteration or policy iteration on an approximate MDP. We are approximating uh, T and R based on observed samples. If we want to evaluate a fixed policy pi, we perform policy evaluation on the approximate MDP. Again, this approximate here means that we're dealing with estimated values of T and R, uh, estimated uh, transition function and reward function. In model three, uh, we don't explicitly estimate the transition function or the reward function. We deal directly with observations. If the goal is to compute V star, Q star, or pi star, one technique we've talked about so far is Q learning. If we want to evaluate a fixed policy pi, we apply value learning. Now, uh, we talked about temporal difference learning uh under model free approaches which in which the agent experience experiences the world through episodes uh, these episodes can be denoted as a sequence of state action reward next state next action uh, and it repeats if you ever encounter the term SARSA in the context of reinforcement learning, it comes from this uh, particular sequence, S-A-R-S-A, -S -S -A, SARSA. SARSA learning is uh, a type, uh, is essentially 
TD learning or temporal difference learning. We, the agent updates its estimate of uh, whatever function it is or value it is that it's trying to compute, be it V or Q or uh, pi, each transition. So every time the agent observes a transition between state S and state S prime with the corresponding reward R through performing an action A, the agent updates its estimate of the value it's trying to compute. Over time, updates will mimic Bellman updates. Um, and here's a recap of Q learning. We'd like to do Q value updates to each Q state, but we can't compute this update without knowing T and R. Instead, we compute uh, the average as we go. So the agent receives a sample transition, S A R S prime. The sample suggests that uh, Q S N A uh, is roughly this R, the immediate reward, plus gamma of the maximum of Q of the next state, uh, which is essentially the value of the next state. But we want to average over results from S N A. Why? Why do we want to get an average uh, of the results from SNA? Can anybody answer this question? Any guesses? Venkatesh? for the next to transition calculation? Yes, but why do we want to create, uh, calculate an average for SNA? Uh, best, best value of Q. Not uh, quite, capture. not quite. Someone else has raised their hand. Yeah, professor. Go ahead. Uh, maybe a probability. Tell me more. You're very close. Uh, like, uh, if you want to go to the next state, the probability has to be more. So it will add up into the Q value, the, prob the average or the probability value. Very close. Very close. Excellent. So the answer is, we are dealing with a non-deterministic environment which means that when you're in state S, if you perform action A, you don't necessarily end up in a state S prime. You may end up in other states, right? That's why we want to calculate an average over the results from being in a state S and performing action A because this is a non-deterministic environment and the uh, consecutive states the next state is not always is not necessarily always S prime. It may be some other state with some other reward value. This is why we are looking to looking to find the average over the results from being in the state S and performing action A. So we keep a running average every time we see. Uh, a state S and an action A being performed in a state S. We update our estimates of Q, S, and A through this running average formula. Now remember alpha is the learning rate and it's a value between zero and one. We talked about the amazing result that Q learning converges to the optimal policy in the limit of infinity even if you are acting suboptimally. But again, in the limits of infinity, in terms of the number of samples observed, in terms of uh, the amount of exploration that's been done. Okay, let's watch a quick demo.
So this is going to automatically run Q-Learning, and let's watch it. So what do we see here? First Can you hear the audio from this uh, demo? Yes, Professor. Okay, thank you. So this is going to automatically run Q-Learning, and let's watch it. So what do we see here? First of all, remember this is a table of Q values, which means for each state that has multiple actions, we evaluate each action separately. Because just because a state may be good doesn't mean all of its actions are good. For example, you can see here that the right thing to do is to walk straight towards the plus 10, even though all of the squares, in fact, on the cliff have a bad action available. You shouldn't take it. You shouldn't jump off the cliff. Now, of course, this agent jumps off the cliff every now and then. This agent is not following the optimal policy, right? In the optimal policy, you don't occasionally jump off the cliff for kicks. But if you look at the Q values, the Q value, for example, in this state here in the middle on the left, the Q value to the right encodes what you will receive under optimal action. It doesn't encode what you would receive given that you have a propensity for jumping into the cliff. Okay? And that's amazing. It's not telling me how well I have been doing. It tells me how well I could do. That's off-policy learning. Even though you aren't following the optimal policy, you still compute its Q values, which means at any time I could stop bumbling around and just do the optimal thing once I've done this process long enough to have learned it. A couple other things to note. First of all, I have no idea what this square does, because I can't get there. Of course in reinforcement learning you're not going to learn about things you can't try out. Secondly, there's some stuff up here that I have never really been in a position to try. So maybe they're great. I don't know. We'll talk about these issues in a bit. All right, let's talk about these issues. Remember I mentioned the explo explo exploration versus exploitation dilemma? Let me, let me give you a real life example. We as human beings deal with this problem too. It's not just for artificial reinforcement learning agents. Imagine that you have a favorite pizza place, right? Uh, you already know that you like the pizza over there. There's a particular pizza that you always order. But now, today, somebody comes along and tells you that there is a new pizza place that has opened very close to the other pizza place, and you have the option of getting your pizza from there. How would you decide between going to your usual place or going to the new place? Well, if you do a quick risk analysis, the new pizza place may actually be a lot worse. You may not like the pizza that they offer and you may regret going to the new pizza place or you may actually find that the new pizza place is much, much better. The pizza there is a lot more tasty, a lot tastier than the usual place. So making a choice in this bijunction is a problem of exploration versus exploitation. You already know that the usual place is great, but there is a new option available and you want to decide whether to risk it and go to the new place or go back to the usual place. So how does an RL agent explore? There are several schemes. And when I say several, I actually mean more than 10, uh, possibly more than 100 different schemes proposed for forcing exploration in training an RL agent. The simplest of these is perhaps performing random actions or the epsilon greedy exploration mechanism. What's the idea here? So at every time step, the agent flips a coin with a small probability epsilon, the agent acts randomly. 
So the agent chooses a random action from its set of permissible actions to perform. And with a large probability one minus epsilon, remember epsilon is a probability, so it's a value between zero and one. With a probability one minus epsilon, the agent acts on the current policy. So this sounds simple enough, right? What's the problem with this uh, mechanism? You do eventually explore the space, but once the learning is done, you still keep thrashing around. Why? Because still with probability epsilon, you end up acting randomly, even after you, you're done learning. So one solution to this problem is to lower epsilon, the value of epsilon, as you move through the iterations. Another, solu another solution is exploration functions, which I'll talk about in a couple of slides. First, let's take a look at a demo. This is uh, a demo of Q-learning based on manual exploration. So by manual exploration, I mean somebody, some, somebody like you and me, sits down and explores different states by hand. This one's manual. This is a variant of the grid world where, well, I won't tell you what it is, right? You look at this and you think, well, how should I act? What is this? Well, you've been listening to this lecture long enough that you know this is probably some fire pits on the side of a bridge or something. But for all you know, this is just, you know, 12 doors, one of which has a huge prize. So first of all, just looking at this, you kind of got to try everything. Now, what if we did this? What if we went over there? We did that a couple times. OK, it looks like we're going to get plus one if we go there. Now, if all we did was exploit, we would continue going left forever, and we would receive a string of plus ones episode after episode. Is that the best we can do? Well, maybe, right? We could be following the optimal policy right now. But kind of, in some sense, we got to try other stuff, because we're going to be playing this game for a while. As far as we know, we're going to play it forever. And so we need to explore. So we might do things like jump off the cliff. OK, that was bad. OK, maybe we'll jump off again, just to make sure we didn't get a weird outcome. No, it's looking pretty bad. We might go over here. Oh, that one's good. It's so good that now the other one doesn't even look good to the left anymore. And so now we go here. Now are we done? Well, we've got a lot of things we should try. Now let me point out something, which is that you have a lot of knowledge about the structure of this MDP. So once you see one fire pit, you imagine maybe there are some others. The algorithm has no such concept right now. Right? As far as we know, Jumping off this cliff will be equally good as the good exit, but in fact, it's equally unsuccessful. Well, what about this pit? We've got to try that too, right? So you spend a lot of time jumping into pits because you really just don't know their pits until you try it. So you've got to make some mistakes. You've got to explore. But of course, you don't want to just be like jumping in them over and over again once you know they're bad. So you don't want to explore randomly or forever. Okay. Now let's watch a demo of exploring using the epsilon greedy mechanism. Oh, what happened? Here's the crawler. And now you can finally see what this epsilon control here is. This means 80% of the time we take a random action. That's a lot of exploration. It's not, however, a lot of progress. Now, will this work? Q-learning works just fine with lots of random actions. It just doesn't necessarily work quickly. So I skip some steps. Uh, we've got some vague clue. I'm going to skip a million steps, right? So we compute and we compute and we compute and we compute. And now it actually turns out that this bot has had a lot of experiences here, even though I fast forward it. Presumably it should have learned something. Why is it not making any progress? Well, we're forcing it to act randomly 80% of the time, right? If whenever you walked your left leg 80% of the time flew out at some random angle, you wouldn't make fast progress. Okay. So what happens if I turn epsilon down? Let's turn it off and just let it go. Be optimal, right? Well, it's not so bad, right? So it, Q learning learned the right thing, but the exploration was preventing you from doing it. So there were a couple issues there. Let's see what they were. Let's. So our question here is when should we explore? 
remember the random actions uh, mechanism, the epsilon greedy mechanism. The idea was to explore a fixed amount. A better idea is to explore areas whose badness or goodness is not yet established and eventually stop exploring. All right. In other words, explore areas which are less frequently randomly stumbled upon. All right. So this is a lot like uh, dangerous optimism, but it's a type of optimism that makes this approach, uh, that enables this approach. So we have to adapt some form of optimism here. This approach is called, this particular approach that I'm going to present is called exploration function, which is a function that takes a value estimate u and a visit count n and returns an optimistic utility. So the function can be of the form f of u and n, where u is the value estimate, and n is the number of times that particular state has been visited or that particular uh, transition or uh, that particular transition has been observed. And an example of an exploration function is like this. U, the value estimate, plus K, a constant, over N. What does this mean? It means that the outcome of this exploration function decreases as N increases, right? n is in the denominator. So as n increases, f decreases. The more times we visit a particular state or transition, the lower this value of f is going to be. All right, so what can we do with this f? How can we plug it into, for example, Q learning? Remember the regular Q update? This is what we had before. Let's modify it. Let's exchange Q or replace Q with this exploration function F. So instead of dealing with the actual estimate of Q, we are going to consider the F of Q and the number of times a transition is starting from S prime and A prime has been visited or observed. What does this do? This essentially propagates the bonus back to states that lead to unknown states as well. This is essentially, so the value of F is going to be higher when N is small. This is essentially a uh, incentivizing or inducing an incentive in Q learning on visiting those states or those states and actions that have not been uh, visited often. What would be the value of F if N is zero? Infinity, right? So in the beginning, if uh, there is a particular state that has not been visited, its value is going to be infinity, which means that if you follow the estimated policy extracted from Q, extracted from our estimate of the Q, it will end up visiting this state S prime, A prime, uh, a lot more than other states. Does this make sense? Any questions about this? Okay, let's look at the demo of using an exploration function. Here is that same bot 
It's still doing a tiny, tiny bit of exploration through randomness, but it's implementing a exploration function. So this bot is implementing an exploration function. And as time goes on, the exploration function will contribute less and less. And what that means is that even though at the beginning it's trying all kinds of stuff, very quickly it figures out that it actually knows what those actions do. And the dominant behavior is now one of exploitation. And, you know, it's a slightly weird policy, but he's off. Okay. So unlike the other one, which had to run millions of steps and then I had to turn its exploration off, this one is already moving after a very small number of iterations. Okay. So I'm going to start talking about a new metric. Before doing so, does anybody have any questions about epsilon greedy uh, or exploration functions or exploration in general? Well, the fact that you have no questions can be either really, really good news or really, really bad news. At any point, if there is anything unclear, just let me know, okay? Now, let's talk about regret. Even if, we, if our agent learns the optimal policy, it will still make mistakes along the way. Why? Why would an optimal policy make mistakes? I need somebody to say something here. Shantanu, you are my savior. Go ahead. Uh, if it gets any new position or something new condition, so the assumption is the policy is optimal for all states. Mm. All right. Um, do you want to go back to mute, Shantanu? Yes, sir, but uh, as it is in reinforcement learning, uh, it is going to learn by itself, so definitely it would make mistakes. That's correct. That's during training. That's during training. And the assumption here is the RL agent, after training, has found an optimal policy. So we are assuming that the optimal policy has been found. But it will still make mistakes. Here's why. Because the environment is non-deterministic or can be non-deterministic. So there are times when the optimal policy at part, this particular uh, state, for example, tells the agent to move forward, but the agent ends up going to the right and falling into the fire pit. Also, there can be multiple optimal policies. Right, so the optimal policy is not necessarily unique. A particular, a, some settings can have multiple optimal policies. Now, regret, just like uh, in real life, regret is a measure of your total mistake cost, which means it's the difference between your expected rewards, including useful suboptimality, and optimal expected rewards. So regret is the difference between the rewards obtained by applying the policy and the sum of rewards that could have been obtained if something had been different, either in the policy or uh, in the environment, including the chance events. Minimizing regret goes beyond learning to be optimal. 
it's a meta learning problem. It requires optimally learning to be optimal. For example, random exploration and exploration functions both end up with uh, end up giving us the optimal policy at the limit. But random exploration has higher regrets. Any questions about this? Okay. Now let's, uh, Ramu. Yeah, Professor. Uh, like in the previous slide, yes. Uh, you said that the optimal policy may not be the same for the environment. Yes, so there can be multiple optimal policies for an environment. Then uh, the agent will be trained based on the environment, right? Yes. Then why would we regret, like, why would it make mistakes if the robot is trained properly based, uh, with the respect to optimal policy? So after training, after training, regrets can occur due to chance events. So during training, the agent learns that the best action to take in this particular example of grid world with fire pits on the side is to move forward. If the agent goes right or goes left, the expected reward in most cases is going to be very negative. So it has to keep moving forward, right? But there are some settings in the environment like chance that, for example, with 25% uh, probability moving forward may actually translate into going right or going left. Right. So in that particular setting, in that particular episode, the policy has led the agent into an early grave or an early fire pit. You can also define regret for training time as well. This particular example is an example of a regret of regret in training time. Random exploration uh, is going to do a lot of redundant or uh, damaging actions because the choice of actions through epsilon greedy is totally random. Any action can be chosen. So the regret during training, if you choose epsilon greedy as your uh, exploration mechanism, is going to be higher than using exploration functions that essentially incentivize exploring less visited places instead of incentivizing or inducing taking any random action. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, got it. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? No. All right. So let's talk about approximate Q learning. Somebody in the previous lecture mentioned that Q learning can be real really slow in real world settings. Let's see. Basic Q learning keeps a table of all Q values. So there is a table that says, if you are in state S, that's one column, and you perform action A, that's in another column, then the value, the Q value is going to be this particular amount, like six. In realistic situations, however, we cannot possibly learn about every single state and every single action uh, in every state. There are too many states to visit, uh, to completely visit during training. And there are too many states to hold the Q tables in memory. Essentially in realistic settings or even in more complex environments, such as Atari games, 
the Q table becomes really, really large and uh, populating it and storing it in memory becomes infeasible. So can you still apply Q learning to those settings? First, let me give you a precursor. The answer is yes. The recent revolution in AI, and I'm talking about deep reinforcement learning, started from uh, integrating deep learning into our traditional Q learning algorithm. So it is possible and Q learning is now being applied in automatic stock trading or uh, automatic control systems and such. So it should be possible to use Q learning in very large state spaces as well. But how, how can we do this? The answer is generalization. We exploit generalizability in the environment and in the states. What do I mean by that? The agent can learn about some small number of training states from experience and then generalize that experience to new similar situations. This, as we will discuss later on in this course, is a fundamental idea in machine learning and we'll see it over and over again, not just in AI. If you decide to learn more about machine learning, the entire idea is over there. Venkatesh, do you have a question? Uh, yes, Professor. You, you told that uh, you had generalized the unvisited states or something like that, right? What was that? Uh, you are telling that we have to generalize the states or remaining all states. Yes. So there are some states that have not been visited but we general, we can generalize from similar states. Yep. But Does that when make it sense? comes to, uh, you have to select the future every time, right? Yes. If it is unvisited, it means it, it's going to be a disadvantage. Um, there's a trade off in the amount of work you, as the designer of the RL agent, okay. have to put in in terms of effort and the cost of training the agent, right? In the real world scenarios, typically your effort, the cost of your effort in coming up with features to represent the states, as we'll explain in a, in a couple of slides, is insignificant compared to what you gain in training performance and the uh, cost of training the agent. But that was a really good observation that to generalize, we will need to come up with a feature-based representation of states. So every time we have to do it manually, feature selection then? Um, let me talk about this. I'll get, okay. when, when I get to uh, the details of this, I'll explain this further. Okay, thank you, Professor. Any other questions? Shantanu? Uh, is this process the same as transfer learning? Not necessarily, no. no. Uh, in transfer learning, the problem is, this is just for the general knowledge of the class. The problem is, for example, you've trained a, an agent to walk, and now you want to train an agent to run. Instead of training the second agent from scratch, you may be able to transfer some of the learned properties of walking to facilitate or enhance or reduce the cost of training the running agent. That's transfer learning. There are applications of transfer learning in reinforcement learning, especially in deep reinforcement learning. Unfortunately, we won't get to talk about those in this lecture or in this course. Okay, Professor. Thanks for this question. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. So let's look at an example. Let's say we discover through experience that this state is bad, right? This particular state uh, with this configuration and Ms. Pac-Man being here facing the Western wall and two ghosts surrounding it is bad. 
We learned that through experience. In naive Q learning, we know nothing about this state. So if we do not visit this state, this new state, we know nothing about it. But as natural instances of intelligence, us, humans, can tell that this state is very similar to this state and can be as bad. What about this one here? How is this one different from the first one? There's only one dot missing up here. This is a different state, but for all practical purposes in this problem, this state is the same as this one. Can we come up with an approach that makes use of similarities to prevent us from having to visit every state to reason about them and their values? The answer is yes. Let's look at a demo here. So this is gonna be a very small Pac-Man board. And what you're gonna see is you're gonna see a bunch of states fly by. Each state is going to have a Q value for each action. And we're gonna slowly learn. So here we go. Tiny little board, we died. We died. Oh, we won. We died, we died. You mostly die. Why? Because you don't know what's going on. You're like, I've never seen the state, let's go left. And meanwhile, the ghost is like, yum. <laughs> Every now and then you accidentally eat the dot. You lose a lot of Pac-Man this way. The regret is very high. Okay, let's look at another demo. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let it run 2,000 times before we see anything. After 2,000 times, You've seen all these states before, you know exactly which ones are good or bad, and now you can do some amazing gymnastics and dodge the ghost. And in fact, that was a win. So you win and you win and you win and you win. Okay. One more. Is it one more? Or is it the same? What about this? This board isn't much bigger, but it just takes a long time before you find your way to that dot. And the ghost just isn't going to let you do it. And what are you learning? You're like, oh, in square 2 comma 3, it's kind of bad to run into the ghost. Oh, in square 1 comma 2, maybe I shouldn't run into the ghost. Yeah, so that's basically not going to work. Okay. So how can we solve this problem? Let's first uh, talk about feature-based representation. A solution to this problem of lack of generalization or exploiting the similarities between the states can be to describe each state using a vector of features. And in this context and in machine learning in general, features are attributes or properties that describe the state uh, accurately enough for a particular task. Features can be seen as or considered as functions which map from states to real numbers. Not often zero or one, but sometimes zero or one. And these functions capture important properties of the state. Example of features in the settings of Ms. Pac-Man include uh, distance to the closest ghost, distance to the closest dot, the number of ghosts in the environment, one over distance to dot squared. And now here are those zero one examples. Is Pac-Man in a tunnel, as in, in between two walls, and so on. Is it the exact state on this slide? Well, here's the thing. Similar states may have similar feature representations. And in some cases, 
if they are for all practical purposes the same, but there, there are minor irrelevant details that differ. For example, there is only a dot missing uh, in the earlier example we were looking at. Features, feature vectors or feature representations of those states can actually be the same. Now, another interesting thing is we can also describe a Q state with feature functions. How? Let's look at linear value functions. Using a feature representation, we can write a Q function or a value function for any state using a few ways. We can say V of S is equal to feature one of state S. This is feature one multiplied by a weight that tells us how important this feature is, plus feature two derived from state S multiplied by a weight telling us how important it is and so on. This is a linear representation. Can we always represent uh, any value function with a linear representation, with a linear equation uh, of weighted features? The answer is no. You can approximate it, but let's assume that this is sufficient for now. This sort of linearization is sufficient in, for our practical purposes. You can do the same with Q. So instead of F1 of S, we have F1 of S and A. This is a feature derived from being in the state S and performing action A, and so on. The advantage of this representation is our experience can be summed up in a few powerful numbers. Those powerful numbers are these weights, essentially. These features are calculated automatically when you pass the states to, to them as arguments. The disadvantage is states may share features, but actually be very different in value. So this brings up the problem of feature engineering. How can we come up with a set of features that very well distinguish between states that are different in value. Now, there was a discussion on whether this is worth it or not, or whether this feature selection needs to happen manually uh, or not. The answer is, well, the recent revolution in AI, deep reinforcement learning is essentially based on the idea, the core of it, the foundation of it, the revolutionary aspect of it is to use deep learning and its automatic feature engineering and feature selection uh, powers to derive these feature functions automatically from raw inputs, right? So the power of deep reinforcement learning is in that you don't have to come up, one of the powers of deep reinforcement learning is that you don't have to come up with your own features. The deep learning model automatically comes up with a good feature representation for your particular environment. Um, this is just for your general knowledge. I really wish I had time to uh, talk about deep reinforcement learning a lot more in this course. I will provide external resources for those who are interested to learn more about this. Now let's see how we can use this feature representation to solve the problem of uh, large state spaces. The answer, one solution to that is approximate queue learning which is essentially Q learning with linear Q functions. We have, we observe a transition from state S to state S prime uh, by performing action A and getting a reward R. This is the difference between our observed Q value and our estimate of the Q value. 
And this is the update that we've seen before, right? This is exact Q learning. Now, in approximate Q learning, instead of updating the Q value, we update the weights of those linear functions. So each weight at each step is going to be updated through this process. The current estimate of that weight plus a learning rate multiplied by the same difference multiplied by the feature function. Does this work? Yes. How does it work? Well, intuitively, you can think of this update as adjusting weights of active features. For example, if something unexpectedly bad happens, blame the features that were on or had a higher value. So reduce their weight, reduce their importance, or disprefer all the states with that state's features. The formal justification of this is based on online least squares uh, or the least squares method. So let's look at an example. Imagine that we begin with this representation of the Q state. Uh, we start with an initial estimate of weight four uh, for the uh, feature function F dot. What is f dot? It can be, for example, the distance, the Euclidean distance to the closest dot minus a weight one, or actually plus a weight minus one, multiplied by the distance to the closest ghost. We are essentially saying that the value of taking action A in state S is directly related to how close it gets the agent to the closest dot and it's uh, negatively impacted by how close it gets to the closest ghost. All right. So let's say in this particular example, F dot of being in state S and performing action north is 0.5. F ghost of being in state S performing action north is one, then the uh, feature-based estimate of Q or representation of uh, the value Q is going to be plus one. If you just plug in these values in here, you'll get plus one. Now, if, you, if the agent performs the action north and gets a reward negative 500, then it essentially dies and we can update the weights for f dot and for w, update the weights for f dot and f ghost, which are essentially w dot and w ghost, through the same uh, running average process that we, we've been applying for Q learning and value learning. It's going to be the current estimate of the weight plus a learning rate multiplied by the difference observed, we expect to get uh, a value of plus one, but what we get is minus 500. So the difference is minus 501 multiplied by the value of this feature, which is 0.5. And the same for the weight of ghost. And as we continue doing this, the estimates or the weights are going to become more accurate and our estimate of Q as a result is going to become more accurate. Let's look at a quick demo. What's nice about this is you learn so quickly from even one experience you can learn that ghosts are bad. So what you're going to see is you're going to see a game of Pac-Man and a reasonable board with ghosts. And what you should realize is the first time you eat a dot, you get a feedback that lets you learn that maybe dots are good. And the first time you hit a ghost, you have an opportunity to learn that ghosts are bad. So instead of that kind of error and error and error, and finally after 2,000 tries, we master a two by two board, let's see what happens. So, mm, dots are good, ghosts are bad. Okay, dots are good, ghosts are bad. You see it tried to run away. And now, 
pretty good. Here it's not eating the power pellets. If it ate them, it would have a chance to learn that they're good if the feature functions allow that to be represented. In this case, those features aren't present. Okay. Now, let's dig a bit deeper into the relationship between Q-learning and least, uh, the least squares method. So, remember the linear approximation method uh, that you learned in your undergraduate courses or even in high school courses, we are going to talk about regression. Imagine that you have these data points and you want to represent these data points with a linear function so that you can make predictions about points that you have not observed or you do not uh, have in your current set of data points. What's the equation for a line? A line is represented by, uh, remember, it's slope multiplied by some x plus a bias term, right? So this is essentially the equation or definition of a 2D line, two-dimensional uh, line. We want to come up with an approximate of the function that generates these data points so that the error between the values generated by this approximate and the values observed is minimized. Uh, so an example for more than uh, two dimensions, when you have more than one feature is like this. This is again a linear regression because this is a linear uh, equation. As I said, we want to come up with linear representations. And by that, I mean, we want to choose the values of W0 and W1 or these weights in general, such that the error between the actual observation and the prediction of our linear equation or linear representation is minimized. So how can we calculate the total error for all data points? One way is to look at the squared error, the, which is essentially the square of the difference between each data point, the actual data point, and its representation or its prediction through the linear line, uh, which is essentially equal to this. This is uh, y sub i. What do I mean by sum over k? I'm saying that we are looking at a linear function with k features and k corresponding weights. This is just a line representation. We want to minimize this to find a good fit to the data. How can we minimize the error? Imagine we had only one point x with features f of x, target value y, the actual value y, and weights w. The error, as we saw in the previous slide, can be calculated using this equation here. Now, the rate of error or the rate of the gradient of error over each of the weights is essentially given by this formula here. How does this help? It tells us how much we should correct each weight uh, uh, based on the amount of uh, impact it has on the error. So essentially, we update the weight for the nth feature by applying the same running average, uh, the same approach we've been following so far, it's going to be our current value of the weight plus a learning rate multiplied by this uh, gradient. This gradient is telling us uh, the direction of the error. 
So if we walk that direction back, if you think of it geometrically, if we walk that direction back, we've made our estimate closer to the observation, or in other words, we've minimized the error. Um, I know that the time is up. Please, if you can, stick with me for another five or 10 minutes so that we can finish this lecture. Otherwise, you can watch the remaining of this lecture from the recording. All right. Now, for remember the approximate Q update that we talked about before? We said it's for approximate uh, Q learning, we are going to update the value, the value of, or the estimate of each weight, the value of each weight based on its previous value. So far it's this. And then we have the learning rate multiplied by the rate of error, which in the context of Q learning translates into what we actually see. This is the target minus what we estimated we should see, the prediction multiplied by the feature value. So this is just an in-depth explanation of, uh, in explanation and interpretation of uh, approximate Q learning. Now let's talk about overfitting. What's overfitting? It's when you come up with a function or an, a representation that fits the data, the available data perfectly. But if you give it an, uh, if you provide an unseen data point, the error between the prediction of this function and the actual value of that data point is going to be huge. Why? Because this function is very highly fitted to the observed data. See, it's a, a polynomial of degree 15. And this does not leave room for generalization to unseen instances. Everything should follow very closely with this representation. Uh, this is something we'll talk about when we get to our machine learning lectures. But for now, just know that the best fit to the training data is not always the best representation or the best uh, model for your uh, settings or environment. Why? Because it may overfit and not be able to generalize to unseen instances. Now, again, this is something that we'll come back to. I was just, I just wanted to point out that this is an issue that may arise. You won't be dealing with this issue in your project or the corresponding assignment for RL. We'll revisit overfitting when we get to our machine learning uh, module. One last topic is policy search. Here's a problem. Often the feature-based policies that work well, which means win games or, or in other words, maximize utilities, aren't the ones that approximate uh, v, the value function or the Q function the best. That's interesting. Let's look at what each of these functions do. The Q learning's priority is to get the Q values as close as possible to the observation. The action selection priority, or essentially solving for the optimal policy, is to get the ordering of Q values right. So it's not necessary for the values to be very close to the actual uh, observations, as long as the ordering of the values for each action is correct, that should suffice in finding the optimal policy. What do I mean by ordering? I mean uh, the action which gives the highest Q value remains the highest even if its estimated value is not uh, accurate. 
We'll see this distinction between modeling and prediction again later in the course when we get to machine learning. Now, what's the solution to this problem? We can learn policies that maximize rewards, not the values that predict them. Remember, the entire point of Q learning, value learning, and such is to find an optimal policy, right? So instead of finding, uh, instead of extracting the policy via finding the values that predict them, we can directly go ahead and look for the optimal policies or optimize for the policy function. One approach is called policy search or a class of approaches is called policy search. We can start with an okay solution like Q-learning and then fine tune uh, the policy by hill climbing over feature weights. The simplest policy search is comprised of two main steps. The first step is to start with an initial linear value function or Q function. Then nudge each feature, each feature weight up and down and see if your policy is better than before. There are a few problems that come up in this setting. How do we tell the policy got better? We have to do policy evaluation, which means we need to run many, many, many sample episodes. And if there are a lot of features, this can be impractical. There are better methods that exploit uh, tactics like look at the structure, uh, sample, uh, better sampling, or changing multiple parameters and such. You're not going to go to any deeper into policy search. I just want you to know that there is a class of reinforcement learning and approximate reinforcement learning algorithms that uh, estimate the policy or iterate over estimations of the policy directly. Uh, and this is to save uh, unnecessary training iterations to get the Q values or the state values as close as possible because the ordering has already been found. Now, I'm going to end the lecture here. Uh, there are, the remainder of the slides include demos of applications of re reinforcement learning in the real world. For example, this one here is the application of uh, RL in autonomous helicopter flight. Uh, and you can go over these videos on your own. This is for learning to walk. This is for learning to play soccer. Uh, and this is for robotic manipulation, uh, navigation in, uh, on other planets, and so on. You can go over these videos yourselves. I'm just going to give you a piece of good news. These demos may seem very complex, but now at this point, you should know the basics of how to train an agent that achieves these amazing results. All right, thank you so very much for staying with me even after the time went over. If you have any questions, I'm at your service.